All right, good uh, morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're at. Uh, my name is Brian Richardson. I am the chair of the Industry Communications Working Group for the UEFI Forum. And I'll be moderating today's discussion on the role of Redfish in UEFI Forum firmware specifications. Uh, I'm not gonna be doing this by myself, fortunately for the audience, so I brought along a couple of uh, experts. Uh, we have uh, Samer from uh, Lenovo and also representing the uh, DMTF. Uh, Jason is going to join us from Hewlett Packard, and Zach is coming in from American Megatrends. Um, quick set of introductions. Uh, Samir Hajj Mahmood is a principal engineer at Lenovo Data Center Group. Uh, he's an author and contributor of the DMTF Redfish specifications. Um, his main role is a lead architect for operating systems and solutions technology enablement, uh, but today he's working as a representative of the DMTF Redfish form. Um, he's active in a number of uh, contributor roles to industry standards bodies that includes DMTF and the UE5 form and has over 20 years of experience in server development, uh, specifically in firmware operating systems and hardware management. Uh, Jason works with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. He's a senior manager of UE5 core development for HPE servers. And he also is uh, developing, sorry, in direct management of the development team responsible for UEFI Redfish support. He's been a member of the DMTF Redfish and UEFI forums and has been working in bias development for 18 years. Uh, he's also chairman of the NVDEM sub team uh, NVST. And finally, uh, Zach Bobroff is with American Megatrends. Uh, he's technical marketing manager for uh, their UEFI and remote management products. Uh, he's a member of both the DMTM, DMTF Redfish Forum and the UEFI Forum, and he's been working uh, at AMI for 11 years on bias development. Uh, I myself uh, have worked at Intel for eight years and previously at AMI for about 15, all in the role of firmware development. Um, but today I'm just here to facilitate conversation as part of the UEFI Forum. So you're here to hear about Redfish and UEFI, so we'll start with an explanation of Redfish. So, uh, Samer, um, since you're the DMTF representative today, um, kind of curious, um, what is Redfish, and if I have a server, how can it help me manage it? Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, so Redfish is an industry standard defined by DMTF, and before we talk about Redfish, Let's give um, a quick overview of what DMTF is, uh, just to um, uh, to set level. So DMTF is an industry standards organization. It has been developing standards for manageability for the last 27 years. Uh, has wide membership uh, across the industry, uh, 50 plus companies, active chapters in China and Japan, um, alliances with. Um, uh, a, a large number of uh, development uh, standards development organizations, 20 plus uh, development organizations and 80 plus universities that are called the uh, Alliance Partners or Academic Alliance uh, members. Redfish specifically is a RESTful API standard defined by DMTF for managing IT infrastructure. It's built on um, modern tool chaining, uh, that are common for web development, HTTP as a transport protocol, TLS for security model, uh, JSON uh, being the body, the content of the files that are transported using the REST API over HTTPS. Uh, JSON allows for human readable uh, text files that are easy for machines to parse and understand and interpret and, and has a wide support in today's uh, programming languages and tool chains. Uh, and not just um, having a JSON text that's easy to, to uh, edit and parse, but also having um, Redfish standard models that are defined by schemas, uh, defined by DMTF um, using JSON schema, open API, and CSDL schema languages. And these standard models cover everything that you see in the data center or um, around the data center ecosystem. So that includes uh, compute nodes, storage, networking, power and cooling equipment, uh, network switches, um, uh, sensors, uh, and, and associated services and platforms. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the DMTF Redfish Forum is a group within DMTF, as a working group within the DMTF standards body that has um, leadership companies uh, from across the industry uh, uh, covering OEMs, um, OS vendors, silicon vendors um, that are leading uh, the definition of this standard as well as supporting companies uh, that are across the industry, um, uh, ranging from IHVs, ISVs, OEMs, OSVs. In addition to these member companies that work on defining the standard, um, the DMTF Redfish Forum has alliances with a number of industry standard partners uh, and organizations that work on expanding the use cases of Redfish uh, to cover all these areas of expertise that these industry uh, standard bodies have. For instance, the UEFI Forum works with DMTF uh, on defining uh, the bio-specific configuration, the UEFI uh, configuration and HII settings and secure boot and boot order, a lot of which we are going to go into detail in this specific uh, webinar. Um, other organizations that work in similar capacity with DMTF include uh, SNIA, the Storage Network Industry Association, that works on defining storage modeling uh, with uh, using Redfish or using something called Saltfish, which is an extension to Redfish. Uh, another example is the Open Compute Project, the OCP, um, which defines uh, Redfish uh, profiles for uh, OCP compliance. Uh, uh, OCP compliant hardware and interoperability. Um, the green grid working with DMTF to define power and cooling equipment modeling. Um, and VME Express as another example, uh, which is coordinating some of the standards for NVME drive management uh, with the Redfish body and so on. And you can see that this is a wide range of industry standards that are spanning uh, multiple uh, uh, verticals, uh, areas of expertise, with Redfish being the common language uh, that they are all pointing to now for, for uh, interoperability and, and management of uh, this various equipment. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to understand how Redfish works, let's first uh, talk about the, the approach for hardware management. Um, what are the design tenants and uh, uh, the, the, the modeling of uh, how to uh, define um, something to be managed through Redfish and extend that definition. So fundamentally, uh, what DMTF, uh, uh, DMTF's goals for hardware management using Redfish is to leverage existing standards uh, uh, evolving around uh, web services and web uh, APIs uh, as much as possible instead of reinventing the standards. Um, that's why you see a lot of uh, existing uh, technologies like REST, HTTP, TLS, uh, protocol discovery using SSDP, uh, Simple Service Discovery Protocol, uh, the idea of doing HTTP callbacks uh, for eventing or using um, server-side uh, 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 streaming SSE uh, uh, connections for uh, another method of delivering events. The idea of using existing uh, data models that are, uh, or existing uh, schema languages that are commonly used in web programming, whether it's being JSON schema, open API, or, uh, or data-based uh, CSDL, uh, XML schemas. These are all existing standards and technologies that DMTF leverages in building this, uh, uh, in, in their approach to building the Redfish uh, hardware uh, management standard. Um, another important uh, design tenant is to um, be able to scale. So if the hardware changes, if the hardware architecture changes, um, uh, whether you have uh, a server with a BMC or some other type of equipment that is managed by an entity, a controller uh, that spans multiple devices, uh, or you are managing an entire uh, rack of servers or an entire uh, uh, data center worth of equipment, uh, you could have uh, what is called a manager, uh, which is a, an entity that implements the Redfish service uh, without uh, being tied to a traditional hardware architecture, uh, uh, for example, uh, a CPU, a memory, and the DMC. 
the the uh, the there is also the idea of separating the protocol and the data model that allows the API to evolve independently of the data that that API is describing. So we can keep the API as stable uh, as possible uh, and to ensure some some sense of backwards compatibility with existing clients that implement that API and still be able to extend the data model to define um, new types of devices or uh, entities that can be managed and discovered uh, using that API. Um, using things like uh, technologies like REST and JSON that are used in commonly used in modern uh, web programming, um, IT professionals, that work in DevOps uh, uh, and in, in managing uh, these, these type of equipment are familiar with programming uh, to the, these type of technologies um, instead of reinventing and learning something uh, completely new. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you may ask, well, why the choice of HTTP, REST, and JSON specifically? Um, well, other than the fact that they are very uh, commonly used in today's uh, web uh, APIs, web style API and programming. Uh, for instance, REST APIs make up more than 80% of web style APIs in use today. Um, JSON, for example, is four times more searched or referenced than XML in the last few years, um, uh, according to, to uh, uh, for instance, uh, Google, uh, analytic, uh, Google search uh, uh, analytics. The, the ability to read and write the text of the JSON uh, payload uh, for humans to be able to edit it helps a lot in, in uh, aiding developers in, in understanding uh, the, the the API and the data model and be able to modify and debug and develop a uh, new code. Um, take for example this REST API illustration that's using JSON as a body. In this simple illustration, you have a client uh, talking to a server. Uh, the client is using the server REST API uh, by sending a specific HTTP verbs uh, uh to that uh to that server hp verbs are uh, commands like get uh, to read a payload put to upload a payload or or, or patch to modify uh, a value in a payload and post uh, to send a command um delete uh, and head are other hp uh, verbs in this particular example the client is sending an http post to a specific uri that's defined on the server this this uh, URI on the server is the slash service slash weather. So this is the, the server's uh, weather REST API. So the client sends a, an HTTP post and the payload in that request, in that post, uh, has a JSON, um, uh, two, two JSON elements or two JSON properties. The property city with the value New York City and the property units with the value Fahrenheit. So the client is requesting from the server give me the weather in New York City in Fahrenheit. So that HTTP post goes to the server and the server response back is some kind of an HTTP success. So that would be an HTTP status code 200 with a response that's also in JSON that shows the low temperature and the high temperature. Uh, JSON is uh, flexible, allows you to write uh, arrays, strings, integers, floating points, embedded objects, and you can define all of these elements and the properties and their values and their behavior using a schema uh, like JSON schema or uh, open API schema that are supported in that fish. Uh, one last uh, point here that's important is uh, HTTPS has a known security model using TLS uh, uh, for encryption, very widely uh, uh, adopted and recognized in all of today's uh, web uh, transactions. In, and that is uh, much more preferred than trying to reinvent the security model uh, by defining some other uh, new proprietary protocol uh, defined just by DMTF. So that's uh, uh, HP and JSON. Uh, next slide, please. You can see an example of uh, just for illustration, uh, some Python code just that shows how easy it is to work with 
uh, REST API using JSON payload. In this particular example, um, I'm using uh, some library that's already available in Python to read, uh, to do HTTP requests and, and connect to an HTTP server. So this is just a URL open for that particular IP address where the service exists. The slash redfish v1 is defined to be the root of the redfish service. And uh, I'm specifically requesting the system one uh, object. Um, you read that data as a raw HTTP value, and then you can use the Python built in way of uh, parsing JSON uh, using the JSON uh, uh, library. And what you get out is a dictionary that's already tokenized of all the properties in that in that object. And I can access any of them using their name. So I would say uh, print the serial number and I get the serial number as an output. Very simple. There's a lot more if you want to do error handling and verification of the certificate for the security connection, et cetera. But just for illustration of how easy it is and how widely available uh, HTTP and REST and JSON support is in various programming languages. This happens to be Python. Next slide, please. So here's as an illustration what uh, a Redfish data model may look like. Remember that the data model is independent of the API and it's flexible, so it could grow and and expand and be and it will need to be dynamically discovered uh, but you can see how uh, everything is connected to the root of the service so you do your first http get on the slash redfish slash v1 to access the root of that service and from there you can get to uh, all the other subservices uh, that are available within the redfish service such as the job service to create jobs the tasks to monitor progress of tasks the event service to receive alerts, um, the account service to configure the accounts to log in to Redfish, the update service for firmware and software update of, the, of this device managed by Redfish, and so on. And you can also access entities in addition to services. You can access collection, collections of entities. So for instance, collection of systems, which is a logical view of a system, uh, collection of chassis, which are a physical views of the chassis or collection of managers, which are the uh, the BMC-like entities or the entity that's implementing the Redfish service in, in case a BMC does not exist. And all of these collections have instances, so you can have um, multiple systems or a single system, um, multiple chassis, multiple managers, and they all have relationship to each other. You can say managed by or, or uh, contained within uh, and so on. And your endpoints are the devices, the logical uh, or physical entities that are represented by these uh, collections. So that could be your bias configuration, your storage configuration, memory processors, uh, inventory or configuration, power uh, supplies and power readings, power sensors, thermal temperature sensors, PCI slots, virtual media, and so on. And, and the list keeps growing as DMTF adds more data models to manage using Redfish. Next slide. Uh, another illustration of uh, a simple HTTP get to, the, to a Redfish service. The root of the service uh, would simply return a JSON body that looks very much similar like this. Uh, this has links to all the other services contained within Redfish. In this case, the events, accounts, uh, session service, firmware update service, uh, job service, um, and so on. Uh, it also has uh, links to collections like the systems collection or the managers or chassis collection. And it could have properties like the UID or the Redfish version. And notice that there are links to what's called JSON schema and registries. These are the programmatic definitions, the schemas that define all this data model to allow for programmatic parsing. And, and manipulation of the data. Next slide, please. Uh, another example of computer system with various properties and links. Here is how computer system links, for instance, to the BIOS configuration, uh, as well as to the processor's uh, uh, inventory and the memory inventory. Um, 
processor summary shows you the count of processors and so on. This is a very brief uh, snippet of the data that you will get. Some implementations may have uh, tens or even hundreds of properties in some of these objects that are very rich description of everything you can read or write for that uh, specific component. Next, please. In addition to defining the Redfish service that can be implemented by, uh, let's say, a BMC for out-of-band configuration or remote configuration, Redfish also defines a special interface that, uh, that is of special interest probably to this uh, audience uh, coming from a UEFI point of view. The, the Redfish host interface allows for what we call in-band access to Redfish from system firmware, from UEFI, or from the host OS. Um, you can think of it as a replacement for IPMI over KCS uh, in, in servers that have this capability today. It's a more secure, uh, uh, rich, complete access to Redfish, similar to the out-of-band access. You just access it from within the OS. It is a network-based, so you need a network device implemented in the hardware that establishes the connection between uh, the BMC, in this case, and the, and the host. Um, that could be a USB virtual NIC or some other type of dedicated uh, network connection uh, between the BMC and the host. And there is an SMBIS table that describes to the OS uh, how to identify this BMC specific uh, Redfish um, network uh, device and distinguish it from other network devices that exist on the host. Uh, and finally, just to uh, have more uh, references and, and resources uh, for you to learn about Redfish and, and, and see how you can use it in both developing firmware as well as um, uh, using it in managing uh, devices if you are the end user. You can um, go to these uh, resources available from DMTF. Uh, the first one is the Redfish Forum. That is a, a general public forum where you can ask questions, uh, post um, um, suggestions, issues that you're having, and DMTF will look at and respond back with either changes to the specification or clarifications uh, and guidance. Uh, if you are a developer, then the next two links, the uh, Redfish Developer Portal and Redfish Standards page, will show you everything you need to write software that uh, either implements Redfish or that uh, connects to a Redfish service and to manage a device. And finally, if you are a company that would like to join the MTF and be part of defining this standard, you can look at the, at the last link for the DMTF Redfish Forum. Great, thanks, Samer. Um, that was a lot of information in a short period of time, so thanks for condensing uh, hundreds of pages of spec into about 15 minutes of talking. Um, there will obviously be a few questions on how all this works, and we will be taking questions towards the end of the session. Uh, you do have an opportunity in the chat window to put questions in. We're going to have folks uh, pick through those and grab some of the best ones, and we'll answer them towards the end of the presentation. So if you think of something as we're moving along, please go ahead and type it up so we'll have it ready to review at the end. Uh, since we are going to talk about the intersection with... Uh, Redfish and UEFI, it's a good time to talk about BIOS configuration resources. Uh, and even though we use the term BIOS, we're talking about pretty much everything that encapsulates UEFI platform firmware. Uh, normally, BIOS kind of envisions the idea of a press, delete, to enter setup sort of menu, which I have written code for in the past. Uh, Jason, this is a good time to talk about uh, kind of the more modern way of doing configuration. Uh, does Redfish provide resources for that equivalent to the BIOS platform configuration? And if so, how are those resources modeled? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, as you said, most most system admins are you know, familiar with configuring the platform through, you know, through a pre-boot utility. And in addition, like scripting of platform configuration has uh, traditionally been handled by OEM-specific tools with no real industry standard. Um, so as Redfish standardizes remote administration, it, it addresses some of the platform configuration and the process unifies into a, a scriptable model. Uh, this slide up here that is a map of all of the currently defined Redfish resources for configuring UEFI platform settings. The computer system being the start of the singular platform 
is where you'd want to start looking for the UEFI platform settings. Uh, SAMR had a slide that showed some links to different objects from the computer system. Um, uh, you know, we'll look at more of these options up here in the coming slides. But for understanding this, this map that I have, the colored bubbles are separate resources or files within the Redfish data model. The white bubbles refer to objects found within the parent resource. And the arrows are links or URIs that come from the parent and, and link down to the, the sub-resources. The, um, the focus of defining platform config in Redfish has mainly been on settings that are used widely for deployment. And this is why you'd see the boot order override, uh, permanent boot order control, and secure boot configuration. The, the red bubble that I have up there is for the BIOS resource, which is where you'll find all non-spec or OEM UEFI settings. Now, Redfish does not define the name value pairs within this object. It only defines the schema or the structure of that file. So the data in this file is all OEM implementation specific. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit in one of the future slides. The memory chunks resource that was added recently to support persistent memory configuration. And this is a prime example of a new technology that's come along after we're seeing this shift from IPMI to Redfish. So during the development of this new technology, the OEMs and, and even customers are pushing for a, a Redfish configuration resource for these. And so I fully expect that as new resources, uh, as new technologies come, come along, new resources for configuration will continue to be added to the Redfish data model. However, in the BIOS um, resource, you'll still have pre-existing technologies that are still residing in this OEM uh, BIOS attributes uh, resource, and we still need help to try to move those things into standard Redfish schemas. Okay, let's dive into each one of these. The boot, over, uh, boot order override consists of several properties found within the computer system resource. So it's not a separate resource. These are properties within the computer system. And they allow for either a one-time or a continuous override of the UEFI boot order. So with this boot order, uh, boot order override target, you can specify uh, an override alias for the boot target. Uh, in the example that I have shown up here, it shows a pixie target being selected. And this tells platform firmware to attempt a override of the boot order with any discovered pixie target. And the selection of that pixie target in the event of multiple pixie targets is implementation specific for that selection. So it's just to say, whatever the boot order is, I don't care. Let me just uh, override it with a pixie target. Now, if you would rather specify a specific target, uh, I've got a highlighted box up there for the UEFI target value. Now, this requires a separate property be filled out, the UEFI target boot source override, where you would specify the full UEFI device path for the specific target that you would want to use to override. Uh, next slide. The UEFI boot order array is where you would find the resource to control the UEFI permanent boot order, so not just the override. Uh, for UEFI systems, this is the UEFI boot order as defined by the UEFI spec, and the entries must map to the UEFI boot variable names, uh, like boot pound, 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 and boot order. There's also a boot next property that allows configuration of the UEFI spec boot next variable, and that maps one to one. Uh, there's a link to the boot option collections that I have highlighted up there. That's a URI link. Uh, to a collection of all the individual boot options where you discover more rich details about each target that was discovered during the platform boot. And lastly, there on this slide, I don't show, but there's also an action within the computer system to reset back to the default order. And that's something picked up by UFI during boot that the, to, to reset back to the original manufacturing defaults for the boot, the boot order. So from the link from the boot section of the computer system, we link over to a boot options collection. And this gives more detail about the different boot options that were discovered. Um, the, the things that I've highlighted up there, 
like the name and, and the, the display name. There's also a boot option reference, which for UEFI systems, Redfish specs this to be the actual UEFI variable name for that boot target. Uh, and that's what also would be used in the boot order array back in the computer systems resource. Uh, you also find the UEFI device path in here, which again can be referenced for the UEFI target override property back in computer system. And you also see an alias here, which gives a, an idea of what the device type is for this particular boot target, which again is, is something that can be referenced by the override list of values that you can provide in the override. Okay. So secure boot is a separate resource on a computer system. It's linked to by uh, a URI from computer system over to a secure boot. And this, um, this entire resource is, is for managing the UEFI secure boot functionality. You know, going from the bottom up, this resource has uh, the current secure boot state uh, referenced by the secure boot current boot property there. And this is mapped uh, to the secure boot variable in the UEFI spec. Uh, there's also a mode of operation referenced by the secure boot mode property. And that is the allowable values for that are setup mode, audit mode, deploy mode, all mapping to the UEFI spec modes of operation for secure boot. Those two properties are read only. The only writable property of the three there that I've highlighted is the secure boot enable. And this is to enable or disable the secure boot uh, platform policy. And the top box that I'm highlighting is an action that allows the, the user to reset all keys to default or to delete all keys or to just delete the PK. Uh, the use case to note here is that Redfish is allowing remote access and remote configuration of the, the key database to put the system into setup mode, in essence. So if you're deleting all the keys, you delete the PK, you put the system in setup mode, and now you've opened up the system for OS tools to help deploy and to configure the secure boot database. So this is a great way to remotely control um, the system and the secure boot policy for the system. Okay, so this is a little bit busy slide, so I'll talk, talk through it. Um, starting, so this is the memory configuration and memory, the memory chunks is what we're gonna get to, and that's for configuring persistent memory. But just starting at the top, uh, under computer system, you've got two links to different memory resources. And in the top right, the link is over to the memory collection list, which you'll find all of the physical memory modules in the system. Uh, this is an inventory collection, uh, only read-only information found here, and it's a collection of all the DIMMs, uh, and those DIMMs may be volatile DIMMs or they may be persistent memory modules, but that's just list out all the different memory modules in the system. Now, under computer system on the left, um, the memory domain collection has a list of the memory domains where you collect all of the referencing the memory uh, modules from the memory collection into those that fall under the same interleave set. So memory domains collects all the memory modules into interleave sets. And from there, we get down to the memory chunks resources. Uh, this has provided a mechanism to carve up a domain into sized pieces of volatile and non-volatile memory ranges. So the, the desire here was for um, the new Intel or um, the, the new persistent, persistent memory modules that have come out recently that allow you to carve up into different uh, volatile and non-volatile memory sizes. This is a way to configure that. And the unique part about this particular resource is instead of just updating properties directly in the resource, uh, the operations are to delete the entire resource and then post a brand new resource to go and configure these memory chunks. There's more data on this on uh, the DMTF and I advise people to go read into that. Uh, the last slide I have is to talk about the BIOS settings and attribute registry. Uh, this is a flat array of writable OEM specific name value pairs 
Typically, these map to HI questions, but they don't have to. Um, these attributes, they also may map to defined keywords in the UEFI namespace registry. And I linked that up on the slide there. Um, basically, this resource is a grab bag of all bio settings that have not found in the Redfish back schema. So non-spec, non-standard, flat array of name value pairs. Um, hopefully, more settings will continue to migrate from the Redfish or into Redfish standard schemas as the community and customers require the standardization of platform features. So that's the desire. Uh, currently, you'll see many different implementations of this. There's no standard and very non-interoperable. Uh, and if, if you want to go look into more, I, I did a presentation at the Spring Plug Fest this year, and you can go look that up on UFI Forum, where I go into a lot more detail about uh, the complications and pitfalls with the implementation of this particular resource. So hopefully we continue to work as a community and move these things out and, and try to define standard schemas in Redfish to support more interoperability for UE5 platform configuration. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jason. And I'm glad you brought up the namespace registry. That is one area that I agree we need a lot more industry participation in. So folks who are already members of UA5 form or have been interested in joining and getting involved in uh, making the systems more manageable, that's, that's a nice area for contributions and collaboration. Okay, so we've learned a little bit about the background of Redfish and how these two specs interacted and interact. I think we need to look at some more practical lessons. So, Zach, you work for a company that does both platform firmware, what we've typically called BIOS, and also Redfish and manageability products. So, as these two specifications have been deployed, what have you been learning about the intersection of UEFI and Redfish? Thank you, Brian. Um, so, as I'm going to get into in the next few slides, um, some of the key areas is we've talked about the transfer of data between both the system and the management controller, and how do you best uh, optimize that transfer of information. But just to highlight a few of the items that uh, my colleagues have already talked about, Redfish is a much updated specification compared to IPMI. Uh, it's abstract in the way that UEFI is, so it allows you to build your own custom tools either at the OEM site or even at the end user site. So it gives people the freedom to manage systems that are either done by one manufacturer, multiple manufacturers, or even going a, a white box route of where they just go to an ODM. So it really gives the end user or system admin the freedom to manage the systems the way they want. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Hello? Okay. Yeah, Zach, I, I, I'm not sure if you've had a delay, but they're on the Redfish hardware slide, so. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, the Redfish specification, like I mentioned, is a very abstract specification and similar to UEFI, does not go into actual hardware implementations. So a system can have a BMC, uh, they can share a BMC with multiple systems, or there might actually not be a BMC on the platform and all communication happens over a network communication to your management controller. Uh, the in-band defined interface from a host system to a management uh, network is the Redfish host interface defined in the Redfish spec, which is defined as a network configure or network connection. Uh, the common hardware design that most people use though is to have either uh, a Pilot 4 or an A-speed uh, chip on their platform that they're talking to over a USB connection that emulates a LAN device. So it's almost like there's a USB LAN device plugged into your system, and it's commonly called LAN over USB. Next. So, like I said, Redfish provides the APIs, and the implementation is down to the developer. Uh, this is very similar, once again, to how UEFI defines their interfaces, so just the high-level APIs. And many of the Redfish interfaces must provide information that cannot normally be gathered by the BMC on its own. 
So the BMC might be connected to different hardware devices to be able to find network devices or to find storage devices. But the UEFI firmware automatically has to find these things as it boots and in a very generic way can collect the hardware information and provide this to the Redfish firmware. While the host interface is defined in the spec, much of the underlying data transfer from the UEFI firmware to the Redfish firmware is proprietary and is important to optimize. So you can use the uh, REST capabilities that uh, both Jason and Samer have talked about, but you can do further optimizations to uh, make sure that you're only transferring data when necessary. So if we go to the next slide, this is just a simple picture of BIOS setup. Jason's already gone through uh, a number of the things in there, but basically all the information in here every single boot or any time things are changed needs to then be transferred to the management of firmware and the Redfish um, attribute registries. So you, you might look around here and you only are familiar with five or six options in the BIOS setup or this is where you commonly go. But if you go to all the pages, there's hundreds if not thousands of options on your platform that must be kept up to date between the UEFI firmware and the Redfish firmware. Um, so if we go to the next one. So the UEFI specification has very clear definition of how uh, configuration data should be compiled, uh, browsed, and exchanged. It's all defined in the HII, or Human Interface uh, Infrastructure chapter. Uh, Redfish does have a slightly different method of storing the data in the attribute registry, uh, as Jason pointed out. Uh, the Redfish specification has differences regarding configuration data that can cause problems. So it's not an exact one-to-one -one copy of the UEFI information. So if I have the same question in my HII data multiple times with different suppressed conditions, because maybe uh, these questions only exist when my storage is in RAID mode, or maybe these questions only exist if I have the UEFI network stack enabled, you've got different sets of questions that may or may not exist, and you need to copy these over to the Redfish Attribute Registry. So you need to actually, um, every single boot, look at these values and see what the real ones are and transfer over what the real questions are so that it can be properly executed on the Redfish side for management purposes. So UEFI has that luxury where everything is evaluated at boot time. Redfish must make it available at all times. So there are uh, some trade-offs that you have to, to work within to get this to work. So as it says, it's not as easy as just copying the HII database from the host firmware to the BMC. Next. Another big thing is the system inventory. Um, system inventory is the detailed list of devices in the system. Uh, should go to as great details as you can. So it can go to the serial numbers of devices, not only your hard drive, but even your memory sticks. It should include as much information as possible so that somebody can zero down on the exact device in the system. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the BMC does normally have the ability to collect some of this information, but it is very dependent upon how somebody defined their hardware. Not everybody, once again, defines their hardware the same way, but UEFI does provide a abstract method to collect all this information. Uh, if you're familiar with UEFI, you can locate all of the PCIO uh, devices or PCIO protocols that are corresponding to a device and then collect information about each device. Uh, for all the network interfaces, you can simply locate all of the simple network protocols and um, interpret information based upon their MAC address. Uh, so you can use those higher level protocols uh, for the hardware information. Uh, similarly, for all the file systems, you can collect those. And on top of all of that, UEFI already provides for the operating system a pretty detailed list of information in the system, which falls under another DMTF specification uh, called the DMI or SM BIOS information. 
So you can also provide the detailed information that's already in the SM BIOS tables directly over to the uh, Redfish firmware as well for it to then parse that information and um, uh, store it in the proper attribute registries. So you don't need to write code that uh, is specific to your platform for a lot of these things. It can be very generic on the UEFI side of things and generic on your BMC firmware so that it's an easy um, communication layer between the two for system inventory. Uh, next. So the data exchange, um, it's important, obviously, because as we've talked, every single time something changes in the system, you need to exchange it. So UEFI collects configuration, inventory information, and other things that both Jason and Sam are talked about, uh, then needs to use the LAN over USB using one of those REST protocols to transfer it. So using that REST protocol, you can easily update information in the registries. Uh, the amount of data being exchanged is in megabytes uh, of information, so it can slow the system boot dramatically during boot. Uh, next. So this is where you need to start talking about optimizing it correctly. So should the information be exchanged every boot? Probably not, because if you're exchanging the information every boot, you could be extending your boot by several seconds uh, upwards of even higher. Uh, maybe you should only exchange the information when the data changes. So if I go into setup and I change a value, maybe I only transfer it over at that time because uh, you have control over the setup browser. You know when somebody went in there perhaps. Uh, maybe you get a checksum of the current network device information or the storage device information and you compare it to the checksum in the UEFI firmware. If that information has changed, then you send it over. If it hasn't changed, you just continue booting on and don't update the registries. Uh, another thing you need to keep track of is what happens when I either do a, a BMC Redfish host firmware update or I do a UEFI firmware update. You need to probably transfer over all the information because something may have changed and some information is now stale. Um, another area of importance is what happens if the BMC and the BIOS boot in parallel? Uh, the BMC may not be ready to transfer information at the time when the BIOS has already collected everything. So does the BIOS wait for the BMC to become ready? And uh, a, an interface like KCS can be used, but this is the old legacy style keyboard controller connection that you would use for IPMI communication. But maybe the BMC never comes up, so should there be a timeout at some point where you don't want to prevent the system from booting, but you're not going to do this exchange. Uh, and also system downtime is at a premium, so you must always try to keep the registry as updated as possible, but you don't want to prevent the system from running. Uh, next. And then we'll quickly go through these last few. Um, it's also been mentioned, I think, that um, when you talk to these registries, or you talk to the BMC, or the Redfish inventory information, it all happens over an HTTP or HTTPS communication more specifically. So anytime you're reading some of this information, you might be able to do it without authentication. But anytime you're updating the information, you need to authenticate to say that you're an authorized person. Um, so should it use a default username and password or should it use a system specific username and password? These can be easily hacked and then somebody can come in remotely and compromise your system. Also, the operating system needs to talk to the host agent. So how does this authentication happen? But on the good side, the Redfish specification does offer a method for doing um, authentication at this point in an auto manner. And every single time that the system boots, a new authentication will be generated uh, that both the BIOS and the operating system can use. Um, if we go to the next slide. So this is referred to as auto-authentication, auto where the information can be retrieved from the BMC of how to authenticate. Uh, but there is not the best method today of transferring that information to the BIOS. Um, so you can use a legacy interface like KCS 
but it all depends upon the hardware design. Was that available or was the BMC only accessible via the LAN communication? So they're currently working on better methods to improve the auto authentication methods. And as well, uh, how does the BIOS pass the information to the operating system? Um, in the specification today, it defines that you provide the information of the username and password for operating system usage in NVRAM variables, which is a clearly defined UEFI interface that the operating system can access. Uh, but is it secure enough? We'll, we'll find out as we go forward with some of these specs as we progress further. Um, and then last slide. The good thing is, uh, as Samra pointed out, uh, UEFI and Redfish are very complementary specifications. They work together a lot of the same companies that are a member of one of the specifications are a member of both. So we are working together to improve all of this. But at the same time, with so much left up to the implementation of the designer or the developer, you need to make sure that you optimize these areas when uh, you can. Like this data transfer layer can delay your boot time pretty significantly. So poorly designed implementations will limit in industry adoption. So if your boot time increases a lot on one system and not the other, an end user might select the one that boots quicker. Uh, and once again, we're working together on these uh, issues between the two specs to make sure that we have a solution for the entire industry. And Brian, back to you. Great. Thanks, Zach. So I know we've got a couple questions queued up, so we'll do a fast summary so we can get to those. Um, we've spent the past uh, 52 minutes now talking about uh, three major areas related to uh, UEFI and Redfish interaction. Can get to the next slide, please. Uh, one is that Redfish is a modern standard for system configuration. It's based on uh, RESTful standards, which are already used uh, across a variety of web-based applications. Uh, Redfish is also designed to configure any level of system stack. We've been focusing primarily on firmware, UEFI resources, but it is designed pretty much for a full system configuration. So it has a, a higher degree of flexibility and configurability than previous standards like IPMI. And uh, finally, UEFI and Redfish are complementary specifications. So a system designer can configure firmware parameters using standardized interfaces, and this, um, this opens up a variety of configuration methods that weren't available based on past standards. Uh, next slide. So the two main places, if you want to follow up for more information, uh, one is the Redfish subsection of the DMTF website. And uh, one of the primary areas we want people to focus on uh, for UEFI is the config namespace area uh, that uh, Jason had discussed earlier. And then I'll actually take us to our first audience question, which I think Jason is probably a good one for you to follow up on. Um, we did have a question of how we can standardize more UEFI settings in Redfish. Uh, good question. So, uh, and simple answer, I guess more community involvement. I think uh, the Redfish work group needs to understand uh, from customers and from users of the service and to know which, which uh, technologies, what groupings of settings need to be standardized, where to put the focus. Uh, so we need more participation from UEFI members in the Redfish work groups. And, and as those um, focus areas start to surface up on issues within the work group uh, will need lots of help on trying to define those new schemas to tackle these standardized groups of settings. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, so there's, it's good that there's already a mechanism in place for that. Um, we had another question come up. Um, if there are any open source tools that are readily available that use Redfish for server manageability. Uh, Sam, are you aware of anything that uh, fits those uh, characteristics? Uh, yes, Brian. So, yes, there are a number of uh, open source and commercial uh, tools available today. Um, DMTF has uh, a number of tools available on GitHub 
that you can access from the DMTF Redfish uh, resources pages uh, developer hub that uh, we include in the slides. Um, those tools are typically written in Python, open source, permissive uh, license, so you can use them or modify them for your needs. And they range from developer tools to user command line tools, similar, uh, for instance, to an IPMI tool. Uh, there are also um, other integrations with open source tools, such as uh, and uh, uh, OpenStack, um, Ironic uh, uh, Stack for servers deployment. Um, a lot of vendors that implement Redfish provide uh, their own uh, open source samples written in Python, PowerShell, uh, um, or other languages. Um, uh, as well as uh, seen integrations with uh, things like uh, uh, cloud forms or other commercial uh, tools uh, available. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, a lot of these tools are uh, references to make uh, users uh, and uh, DevOps uh, uh, IT administrators life easier to get them started with Redfish. Uh, but the fundamental goal here of the Redfish API is um, you can integrate it in your own environment, in your own tool, in your own workflow, depending on uh, what you use for managing your devices. Cool. And because that's Python, it seems like it's easy to get cross-platform support or cross-operating system support developed. So that's good. Um, so our next question, uh, I want to throw this one to Zach, uh, since you've worked on a number of uh, firmware implementations. Um, what do you think most users are looking for when they request Redfish support on a platform? So from the UEFI point of view, uh, obviously most customers are looking for the ability to configure their system configuration remotely, uh, get the full system inventory remotely, and these related features. But if you're talking about just firmware or uh, Redfish as a whole, a lot of our customers are looking to manage their systems in the data center or in the cloud in a non-homogenous way. They're now collecting machines from multiple different manufacturers. So they want a standardized method to manage all of their hardware without having to use complicated tools. They can do the same thing across all of their systems, no matter who the manufacturer is. Okay. So yeah, there's, it seems like there's a class of setting that a lot of people would like to uh, put on, say, just say enabling virtualization for a platform that wouldn't necessarily be vendor specific, and they want to sort of broadcast that to an entire node. Exactly. Um, and that actually ties into the, I think, uh, the next question pretty well. Um, and Jason, I'll let you take a stab at this. Do all Redfish enabled systems support configuring the UEFI boot order? Hey Brian, um, not exactly. Um, most properties and resources defined by Redfish are optional. Uh, Blue order properties are not required. So in fact, none of the UEFI configuration resources that I showed in my slides and talked about today are mandatory. Uh, OEMs may optionally support the boot order configuration. It's, it's really up um, to the system administrator to evaluate the level of support um, across the systems in the data center. So, um, yeah, unfortunately not. Okay. Is there an easy way for someone to interrogate a system uh, to understand if uh, something in the config namespace is supported? Yeah, there's just going to be an HTTP request to see if the properties exist. And if they're supported, they will be in the data model that's on that particular Redfish service. Okay. I would like to add a comment here as well, Brian. Um, sure. That, uh, uh, yeah, like Jason mentioned, most properties are optional. Uh, so in order to uh, specify requirements or compliance to to sp uh, specific properties exist, let's say DMTF defines something called profiles. So you can define your own profile to define the rules of requirements of which properties to be implemented. Uh, and there are tools available from DMTF to check a Redfish implementation against uh, a compliance of a specific profile. Okay, so this is where we get into the nuances of you know the specification, which has broad support for the concept of configuration, and then from a DMTF standpoint, there's a profile that 
would require a subset of what is in the existing UEFI config namespace. Does that sound about right? Yep. Okay. Um, and I think due to time, we're going to have to end it here. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending. Uh, we have made a recording of this, and the slides and the webinar will be uh, made available. So we'll share links um, on the uh, email that we use to confirm your registration, along with our social media profiles. So you should see that posted fairly soon. Um, Samer, Jason, Zach, thanks for your time today. And thanks to the folks at the UEFI Forum who put this webinar together. Um, Appreciate it, and uh, stay tuned. We'll be doing another one of these in a few months. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot.